Isn't this a beautiful little dog, hey? She's such a pretty little princess. And little dogs and babies and other little creatures are always so cute. But I assume you know where they come from, hey? Think of it. Sperm cell meets egg cell and then a zygote is formed and then eventually a lovely little puppy like this or a little baby is formed. But the problem is when the sperm cell comes together with the egg cell, you don't want the chromosome number to double, you want it to stay constant. So the sperm cell and egg cell each have to have half the number of chromosomes. And that's what this video is about. So now we're going to look at a specific type of cell division, but I first want to just distinguish between two types of cell division. If you look on the screen, you get mitosis, which is in the grade 10 syllabus, and then you get meiosis, which this video is about, and it's for grade 12s. In mitosis, you have somatic cells or body cells that are um, to multiply and they make exact copies of themselves and it's for growth, repair and asexual reproduction. But meiosis is different. That is, in meiosis, gametes are formed. So you get sex cells, sperm cells and egg cells. Those two are formed during a meiosis and it allows for sexual reproduction so that when the sperm and the egg cell come together that the chromosome number is um, constant in a species. If you look at the slide now, you can see that meiosis consists of two sections or two divisions, meiosis one and meiosis two. On the left, you've got the, the diploid um, parent cell. And if you look at the writing on the right hand side, it says the parent cell, which is diploid 2N, results in four new non-identical haploid cells. So the four on the right hand side at the end of meiosis two are unidentical and there are four of them. And that, when I say haploid, it means that each with half the number of chromosomes um, as the original um, parent cell. The gametes are not identical to the parent cell because remember now we are making sperm cells or we're making egg cells. Imagine if a couple the, the, the man had sperm that were identical and the female had egg cells that were identical, then every child that they ever have would be identical because there was no change in the chromosomes, in the look of the chromosomes and um, the um, genes that they carry. Now, if you think of interphase, remember in um, DNA replication, you learned that um, DNA replication takes place in the interphase. But now I just want to explain a bit about that before we go into the actual phases of mitosis, of meiosis and comparing the, and meiosis 1 with meiosis 2. On the right hand side there you see you have a, a, a chromosome and then DNA replication takes place and they make a duplicate. The, the two chromatids are sister chromatids and they are joined by a centromere and they are um, that together they make one chromosome because they've got identical information. They made exact copies, but they are um, still form one chromosome. And then I'll just show you on the right hand side that on the chromosome you have these alleles, different ones. It's a, a code. An allele, remember, is a variation of a uh, um, of a gene. So you might have the gene for eye color, but the one allele. Um, on, on one chromosome like this might code for green eyes and then on another one maybe from the father codes for brown eyes. But they are the same, they're coding for the same thing, eye color. So I just want to repeat here that single-stranded chromosomes become double-stranded with two chromatids during um, the DNA replication in the interphase and exact copies are made. Another concept is homologous chromosomes. You need to understand that to understand meiosis. So on the left hand side there, we've got two chromosomes before replication. The one is from the father, the pater, and one is from the mother, the mater. So on the right hand side, after DNA replication, you see that the um, paternal chromosome has two sister chromatids and the maternal chromosome also has sister chromatids. But together, they are coding for the same alleles, or the same, they're coding for the same gene, but they might have different alleles. And, but together, they are known as homologous chromosomes. And that's a very important term to remember in, um, in meiosis, especially in 
Moses 1, in the beginning of Moses 1. Let's just run through what the different phases are. Remember now Moses 1 has prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, but we call it prophase 1, metaphase 1, and so on. And in and Moses 2, we also have prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, and telophase 2. And you have to say a 1 or a 2 after the meiosis or the after the prophase, metaphase, and so on. Prophase, remember, is in both of them, in meiosis 1 and 2, it's the preparation, it's the preparing stage. So when you think of what's happening there, it's preparing for what's coming up, up next. Then you have metaphase, which I um, link with the word middle, M for metaphase, M for middle. The chromosomes line up on the equator. Then you have anaphase, A for away. The chromosomes or chromatids will move to opposite poles. And then telophase is the one cell becomes two. That's just to help you remember. Now, let's, let's compare the different phases in, pro, in meiosis 1 and in meiosis 2. Prophase 1 looks like that. In prophase 2, it looks like that. Now, let's look what's similar. Remember, prophase is preparing. So the one thing that you can notice is that the nuclear membrane disappears. That dotted line indicates that it's disappearing. And then the centrioles are moving to opposite poles. They're getting ready in both prophase 1 and prophase 2 for what's coming up next. But now let's look what's different. On the left, in prophase 1, you'll see that there are homologous chromosomes and they are pairing up. The one from the father, the one from the mother, and they are pairing up together. So you always get homologous chromosomes in prophase 1. And then what happens, crossing over happens. But that's a whole different discussion. I'm not going to go into crossing over now, but just remember crossing over is when they, they cross over each other and genetic material is exchanged. And that increases variation in the species. On the right hand side, you don't see homologous chromosomes. What you see is individual chromosomes visible as chromatids. So they've got chromatids there and there are chromosomes on their own. They're not paired up with anything else. The next one is metaphase 1. You can see there again, you can see it's very special, different to metaphase 2. But both of them, both of these metaphases have the chromosomes lined up on the equator in the middle. Then let's see what's the same. The um, chromosomes are attached to spindle fibers in both of them. On the left, you've got the chromosomes arranged randomly on the equator. How are they arranged? They're arranged in homologous pairs. You've got two together like that, opposite each other on the equator. Whereas on the, in metaphase, there are single, single chromosomes arranged next to each other. So you've got them like that. One chromosome there, one chromosome there, another one, they're all in one long line. If you look here on the screen, then you can see that anaphase 1 looks like that and anaphase 2 like that. They look similar, but slightly different. So what's happening in both of them, remember anaphase A for away. So now the spindle fibers are contracting and they're pulling on the chromosomes. And what's happening on the left is that the, the homologous chromosome pairs that were like that, one whole chromosome is going up and one whole chromosome is moving to the opposite end. So the whole chromosomes from each homologous pair are pulled to opposite poles as the spindle fibers contract. Whereas on the right hand side, this, they, they like that, the centromere splits and now you have one, chromos one chromatid moving to one end and the other chromatid um, going to the opposite pole. Now we get to telophase, the last phase of meiosis 1 and 2. Telophase 1 looks like that and telophase 2 a bit different again. Let's see what's happening on the left. On the, in telophase 1, remember it's one cell becoming two. So the cytoplasm divides to form two cells. Whereas on the right hand side, the two cells are now becoming four cells. On the left, we've got two daughter cells. They have half the number of chromosomes as the parent cell. In the beginning of meiosis 1, in prophase 1, um, it started off as they started off as diploid cells. Now they are half the number. They are haploid cells. Whereas on the right hand side, the four new cells are also diploid. 
uh, uh, sorry, or the four new cells are also haploid. They started off as haploid, two haploid cells, and now they are still haploid. Nothing happened to the chromosome number. And then on the left, you can see that the two daughter cells are genetically different to the parent cell. And on the right hand side, the four cells are also genetically different to each other and to the parent cell, obviously, from the beginning. So that's the end of the steps in meiosis. I want to just recap what the different um, steps are or phases are in meiosis 1 and in meiosis 2. If you look here, you get prophase 1 with homologous chromosome pairs, metaphase 1 where the, chromosome, uh, the, pairs, the homologous chromosome pairs line up on the equator. Then in anaphase 1, whole chromosomes are pulled to opposite poles and then the end result is two haploid cells. Whereas in meiosis 2, if we look at um, prophase 2, we haven't got any homologous chromosomes. So if you see any of these diagrams, you must know immediately there are no homologous chromosomes, so it can't be um, meiosis 1. If you look here on prophase 2, it has single chromosomes, and then on the right, metaphase 2, the single chromosomes line up on the equator. Anaphase 2 at the bottom, now that cr um, a chromosome splits, and one chro a chromatid goes to one end and one chromatid goes to the other end. And at the end, you've got four haploid cells. In prophase 2, they were haploid and they are still haploid. Now I'm going to put up a slide. What's, I want to test you a little bit. Check if you can help me here. If you look at this um, diagram, what phase is it in meiosis? You can see that on the equator, so that must be metaphase. It's a metaphase, but is it metaphase 1 or 2? There are no homologous chromosome pairs, so it has to be metaphase 2. The individual chromosomes and not pairs are aligned on the equator, and that will be your reasoning why this is metaphase 2. Look at the next one. If we look there, we've got homologous chromosome pairs, and what else do you notice? The nuclear membrane is disappearing, so this must be prophase 1. And your reason is that homologous chromosome pairs can be seen and the nuclear membrane is disappearing. These are the kind of questions you could get in a test or exam quite often. The last one is that spindle fibers haven't formed yet. And now if we look at this slide, it is anaphase 2. And why we say it's anaphase 2 is that the, something is moving away from the equator. Chromatids and not whole chromosomes are being pulled to opposite poles as the spindle fibers are contracting. Now let's just quickly go over the importance of meiosis very, very quickly. It increases genetic variation in two ways. The one is that crossing over happens in prophase 1 when the homologous chromosomes are like this and they twist over each other and they exchange genetic material. And then the random arrangement of the uh, chromosomes on the equator in my metaphase 1 and in metaphase 2. They can arrange like that, they can arrange like that, they can arrange like that, they can, they, they, there are lots of options. And that arrangement in any way like that can increase the genetic variation. So now you can see another one is haploid gametes are formed or haploid spores are formed, depending on if it's a an animal or a plant. And then another one, that number three, I'd like you to learn it off by heart because this is a very, very useful um, sentence. The halving effect of meiosis overcomes the doubling effect of fertilization, maintaining a constant chromosome number from one generation to the next. And that's what I was speaking about right in the beginning. When the sperm cell meets the egg cell, you want that chromosome number to be kept constant when fertilization takes place. So that's now a way of looking at meiosis. And I hope that's also um, been beneficial for you. And if you are struggling, watch it again, test yourself. And please subscribe because these videos are going to help you to do well in, in grade 12 and really excel for the end of the year exams.